Hello everyone, this is Charles and Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 115, we're going to take a look at World War II vintage tubes that have some cool properties that might make them interesting for use in audio. But first, caution everyone. Electronics and tube amplifiers have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them, and always consult a professional when in doubt. So here's the two that we're going to take a look at today. It's called the 2C26, and as you can see, it comes in a military box. So right away, that should hint pretty strongly at what it was being used for. It's a pretty nice looking box though, and we can see that it was made by the Hytron Corporation in Salem, Massachusetts. Let's take a closer look at it. Aha! We have a nice looking double top cap tube with a mic and all base and it has the coated glass on there which what was that used for again? Uh, it, was, it was used to reduce uh, electrical interference. Um, a lot of early radio tubes were coated either black or gray. Yes. And the coating's inside the glass of course. Of course. So anyone that's familiar with our, our Yuri monoblock kit amps would recognize these double top cap tubes because we use a similar one called the 2C22 as the driver tube in that amp. We've got a couple of them right here. There's the Kenrad version. These are also military tubes from World War II. This one was made by Kenrad. So just like the other tube we were just looking at, the 2C26, this one has one top cap for the grid and the other one for the anode or the plate. Yeah, and we always sticker the plate. Yeah, just yeah. so that you can't mess it up. You don't want to put high voltage on the grid. Ask us how we know. <laughs> yeah, bad things happen in a hurry when you do that. So the 2C26 has a lot of similarities to the 2C22. They look very similar, although this one's obviously a little bit bigger. But they both have an octal base, the double top caps, and they have a lot more similarities on the inside. They're both medium mu, that's amplification factor, single triodes. While the 2C22 has a mu of 20, the 26 is a little bit lower at 16. But the 2C26 can do something that the 22 can't. It has power. This was designed to send out radio frequency pulses up to 80 miles away. And to do that, it has to be able to push out some watts, up to 10 watts continuously. It's pretty impressive for a single octal power tube at the time. So, if you combine the power output and the amplification factor, this makes it a pretty interesting tube, and it's not unlike one half of a 6N6P in its capabilities. The tubes also had to be built pretty tough. Let me see if I can get this on camera here, but you can see they have ceramic spacers. And I've actually had one of these apart and the plates are really chunky on them. They were being used for a vital purpose during World War II, which was an aircraft. And they were used as um, beacon responders for finding airfields, paratrooper drop locations, aircraft carriers, or even bombing targets. So transponders would be set up in those locations and they were designed to send out a pulse to equipment on aircraft that this tube was in and this tube would be responsible for sending the response pulse. Let's take a look at one of those pieces of equipment and let's clear the deck here too. So this is the AN, well, let me get it on screen here, the AN APN-2 and this is just sort of a description sheet of the equipment that was used for the military. Let me zoom out here actually and get a better in frame. And you can see here they describe what it was used for. And of course I have trouble reading upside down so yeah so you can see it's used in conjunction with suitable beacons for night landings of parachute troops, landing of gliders, and maintaining airborne supply operations in isolated positions. And 
<laughs> Isn't that neat? It was top secret, of course. Restricted, and then it was un unclassified. That's pretty neat. And there's a document that we found which has all these pieces of equipment detailed on there, and you should see the quantities of some of the tubes in, the, in this gear. It's just incredible. Yeah, one of the pieces of equipment shipped with, what, 19 6SN7s? Uh, 19, no, it was 96. 96, right. 6SN7s. No, it doesn't use 96, but that was the tube complement that it went into the field with, right? Probably quite a few spares. <laughs> yeah, I would think so, so. So, this piece of equipment was vital during the war for aircraft to be able to triangulate positions and find where they were going. Let's take a look at another piece of equipment that's from the same time. I think we had this briefly on camera before. Yeah, a long time ago. A long time ago, but this is one of our older tube testers here. And this is the I-177B. It's the precursor to the well-known Hickok TV-7, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. And it's almost the same machine in many ways. It's a well, beautiful I, looking tester. I think it's better built, to be honest with you. <laughs> is it ever well built? So this thing was designed to go to war and take a beating and come home afterwards. They were built to be extra rugged. Everything is corrosion resistant on it. They have brass screws throughout. And the inside is coated with an antifungal shellac coating. They even have a schematic in here, like a lot of old equipment, but it's printed on Bakelite, so it was waterproof. It's pretty incredible. And if we take a look here, in the tube testing data, oh, where's my little pointer? There it is. There's the 2C26 tube testing data. So this tester in the Pacific Theater would have been used to test tubes like this in aircraft. And I could just imagine some electronics technician working his way through an aircraft on some little island airfield somewhere, making sure everything was working correctly with one of these guys. And they weigh a ton, don't they? Oh, they do. And so, the hinges, though, are the best part. Well, the worst part, right? Oh, well, hinges are usually the weak point on it. They're like a mouse trap, though. Well, they're a human trap. <laughs> oh, you mean the latches? Yeah. Oh, the latches. Yeah, I literally bruised my thumbs on these things whenever they release before they release so violently. <laughs> yeah, they're designed to hold and hold forever. Yeah. So, what about the war in Europe? We're, we've talked a lot about the, the Pacific Theater. Well, our allies needed to home in on beacons as well, and they needed a tube that was like the 2C26. So, they used, or at least the Russians at the time used, the GI-3. This is a Svetlana-made version of the 2C26, and it was produced domestically in Russia. They're very similar looking to their Western-produced counterparts, and it's for a good reason. When World War II was on the horizon, Russia didn't have substantial domestic tube production, mostly making unique varieties that weren't compatible with Western equipment. Seeing how this could be a problem, the U.S., with the help of RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, shipped entire factories worth of tooling as well as the expertise to get to get it set up and operational so they could produce vital tubes for russia to use during the war in russia itself that would be compatible with western equipment that was being supplied and it's for that reason that we see a lot of contemporary tubes like this like the 6sn7 that were produced in the former Soviet Union, and they look si very similar, if not identical, to Western counterparts. Particularly the early versions of those tubes. Exactly, like straight plates. Right. That makes perfect sense. So, these are an interesting tube for audio use, but there is a small difference between these and the 26. The Russian one is actually better, and they've shielded, or at least we suspect that they've shielded the heater on here, so it could be used with AC heater supplies because these are dead quiet when we use them in the URI, while the 26 has a little bit of heater hum. So that's something to be aware of if you, if you intend to use them for audio uses. Yeah, and you, you figure that most likely, uh, if you ran the heaters on a DC supply, we probably would see that go away. Yeah, and it's something that we're going to test out eventually here. Yeah, we'll get around to it. All right, so let's clear the decks. And you want to hand me over the preamp, Charles? Yeah. So what's been going on over at Melatone Kits? There we go. You might ask. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> we've been busy. So we've got two prototypes in development. We've got a, a, the first of the phono preamps. We have another one in mind, but let's talk about the one we're doing right now. 
and it's going to be using a pair of 6SL7s or 12SL7s or the lock tool equivalent. So it's going to be called a universal phono preamp as a result. Very similar to our universal 6 or 12SN7 preamp that uh, is our most popular kit by far. It's going to have a cathode follower stage that's going to be a 6 or 12SN7, a single tube. One half for one channel, one half for the other. Otherwise, it's basically a dual mono design. And we are at the point of building the EQ circuits to reverse the RI AA uh, curve. And we're having a lot of fun doing that. We've, it sound, so far, it sounds great. We're going to get a couple of different versions of the EQ up to the point where we can listen to the prototype in system. Uh, you know, it's one thing to see that your curve EQ is nice and flat, that the electrical uh, numbers are good, that your scope's clean, but really, at the end of the day, does it sound great? If it doesn't sound great, it goes back to the bench. If it sounds great, then it gets to move forward. Anyways, this is in development. We've got the headphone kit amp. It's still, we're still working on it. Charles, slowly moving along with it. Slowly moving along. Charles Charles fell ill to one of the three plagues that's going around currently, so that knocked us back a little bit. And the great news is that the GU50 builders are they're a building away. And we actually put we had parts for three more GU50 monoblocks, four test builders only. And one of them has sold. We still have two in the store. And we're still actually trying to get those last three kits assembled because we, we had most of the components, but we actually didn't have a top plate. So, uh, you know, now that the holidays are almost over, we'll be back to full-time work and hopefully we'll have those ready to go out the door soon. But Charles has got the build series underway. And, um, uh, the, you know, I used to do the build series for all of the kits and it just overwhelmed my work day because I essentially run the business on a day-to-day -day basis and Charles comes in to help with shipping and with special projects and with technical expertise. Uh, so having him do the build series uh, on the kit amps is just wonderful. It frees me up to, to <laughs> frees me up to work less than 80 hours a week. So I'm grateful. <laughs> okay, so let's put this aside and see what came in in the last two weeks. I've got it here. Well, some very special tubes, so hang on. Now, because the Phono preamp uses the 6 SL7 or the 12 SL7, of course, we've been trying to source some great tubes. Let's just zoom in a little bit. And this one I've opened, so I know what's in here. Let's just take a quick look at the box. And you might say, Jim, why are you using an old-fashioned twin triode as your gain stage for this phono preamp? Well, because they sound amazing. Typically these days you'll find a 12AX7, which is a modern miniature 9-pin high-gain tube. And I don't think I've got one lying around to show you. Not within arm's reach. <laughs> no. Well, we've got lots of them lying around somewhere. Um, but the 12AX7, besides having Mm, availability issues, it's huge. It's a very high demand tube. There really weren't that many of them made compared to other more common tubes like the 12AU7 or the 6SN7 or even the 6SL7. Uh, so the vintage tubes are hard to find. They're very expensive. A lot of the 12AX7s tend to, to be noisy in a high gain circuit like a phono preamp. So we went, of course, looking for a better option. And the 12SL7 is still relatively available. Now the supply is going to be limited for sure, but for the moment I may we're able to haul in a fair number of these tubes from the 1940s and 50s. And you might say, wow, that 12 SL7 looks a lot like a 6 SN7 bad boy. Well, yeah, they were made in the same years, same factory, same materials, different plates. These Higher gain tubes have an oval or a rounded plate structure, which gives a higher gain through design. And that was invented way back at the beginning of the first tube era. So these are going to sound amazing. 
What else have I got to show you? Well, here is another military box. And of course it's got its military tube number, VT289. But here we see that it's a Jan CHS. CHS just means that it is a Sylvania 12SL7GT. Now I have never opened this box and I don't think anybody has since when. Let's see if we've got a date code somewhere. There we go. Accepted date 545. So that's May 1945. So this is probably war surplus. It probably never went overseas to either the European front or the Pacific front and it was probably sold off you know in warehouse auctions. So it should be in great shape. Now I'm going to see if I can get it open without breaking. Sometimes you have to break the bottom of the box. It's just no way around it because the cardboard it gets stuck. Yeah. Yeah, they designed them also in some cases so that you actually had to tear the card and get them open. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's just not, there is no option. <laughs> yeah, which is a shame with some really nice vintage boxes, but... It's you know, coming. It, yeah. We, uh, we, we should have a Sylvania label. We should have a drum machine or something. <laughs> now, whenever you look at a Sylvania two from the 1940s or 50s, it's almost guaranteed to be one of the wonderful sounding early types. Look, look how stiff. Slow and steady. So that's been in the box for 77 years. Imagine that. It's older than me. <laughs> so there we go. And it's very much like the tube we just looked at, but it's got the black plates and some of the tubes from this era had this sort of yellowish green label some some had a white label and uh look it's just pristine that this is going to test beautifully and this will have amazing sonics particularly in a phono preamp so i'm really looking forward to getting enough of them together to to test it okay now one more quad came in here i'll clear these off here yeah. One of the highest demand, I think I got them backwards, there we go. Hmm. Highest demand power tubes is the Svetlana EL34. They are, they, they just didn't, they made quite a few of them, but they didn't make any, I don't think they made as many as the Mullards, um, as the vintage Mullard XF2. that's the true St. Petersburg version of the tube. Isn't yeah, it? let's just take a quick look at one so you have a sense for what the real tube looks like. You can see that it's got a pair of saucer shaped getters that are angled and as a result the chrome dome sometimes is sort of angled like that, sometimes it fills in. It just depends on how much material they deposited in those cups before they flash the tubes off. This is one of the labels that Svetlana used years and years ago, but had to go back to when they lost the rights to use the wing, the flying C label in North America. Um, and it does, I mean, labels don't change how the tube sounds, of course. Yeah, they ended up going back to this label right here, which is. Can you get it on camera there? Yeah, there oh, there it is. Flying C, there we go. Oop. Sorry, it's hard, catching the light a little weird. Yeah, that, yeah, they use both of these labels and some variations on them over the years. I mean, Svetlana uh, was in business for a long, long time. Anyways, there's a new old stock quad, new in the box. Hang on, I've got a box to show you too. Now, be careful. Uh, there are a lot of fakes of these tubes, and there's lots of reissues of this tube that go back to about mm, 20 years when... Uh, new Sensor in New York started literally copying the two, copying the labels. They had the rights to use the Flying C uh, logo in the U.S. And that just raised all kinds of confusion. I'm not going to comment on what happened. I'm really, you know, if I did, <laughs> it wouldn't be a nice thing I say. Anyways, the... The reissues and the fakes, of course, don't sound anything like the original St. Petersburg factory tubes. They're not the same tubes. They're just not the same tubes. It doesn't matter if the box looks the same. 
or if the labels are the same, electrically, you know, how, how the tube performs in circuit is different. So those are in the store. They are, I think, the second most expensive quad we carry. So I, I wish I could find a lot more and keep the price down, but there's just no way. They're just so rare, and it's so hard to sort through all the all the fakes that are out there and the reissues. Yeah, and we get caught once in a while. Somebody sends us occasionally. I should have actually brought some fakes out to show you, but uh, maybe one day we'll do a fake show. Uh, we've done them in the past, and the we're... We're filming this just in between Christmas and New Year's, and be careful. This is the time of year in which fraudsters operate online. I don't know whether they've spent all their Christmas money and they're broke or what, but this is the time of year in which you see a lot of fake tubes being sold off as, of course, the real vintage deal. So just be really careful. Don't buy from, you know, people on Facebook that you don't know. It's just, you know, we've been burnt, um, and and we know what we're doing so just be really really careful okay everyone if you stay to the very end here's some discount codes to help you out and there's a secret code i'm not going to give you any more hints because it's been cost yeah it's been costing us a lot of money um if you're it we have flat rate shipping around the world of 20 dollars, and if your orders 150 dollars or more after discount the shipping is on us folks have fun Stay safe. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.